or if they come to teach you, then you apply this. You stay away from them. You stay away from them. But how are you going to teach them if they are teaching you? It's either they teach you or you teach them. It's either someone influences you or you influence him. That is how it goes. You get it? Yeah. Yes. Why does what? Why do <laughs> why do many people who do bid'ah hate Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab? It's an interesting question. We should ask them. We should ask them. Cause? Because he proves them wrong. That is one good answer. He dedicated his life to fight with her. You have to know something, brothers and sisters. When you speak the truth, people will hate you. Not dislike you. They will hate you. That is the sunnah, that is the way which you cannot change. You cannot change that. That is why Allah explains so much about the prophets. Which prophet came and did not face opposition? In fact, some of them were even killed. Why? Because they spoke the truth. Yes. Sorry? What opposition did? He faced opposition from his son, Qabil, who killed Habil. He advised him, but he went against his father's advice. And he was the first prophet. Of course, everyone came after him. The people are still good in general. I'm speaking specifically about the prophets who were sent to their people after they were lost. All of them, they faced a hard time. All of them. Each of them. Have no exceptions. No exceptions. That is the truth. The truth is not very likable by the people who don't like the truth. Yes. Yes, that's why they call Ulul Azm, the five greatest prophets. They call Ulul Azm. What does Ulul Azm mean? People of strong will and determination, because they face the greatest trials. Nuh, for how many years he called his people? Nine hundred and fifty years. How old are you, Akhi? Huh? Seventeen. Yeah, you also. If you want to answer that. 26. You feel old, don't you? You feel old. Now imagine your age, multiply it by <laughs> 40 times. 40 times your life now, not 4 times. 40 times. That's almost close to what Nuh lived and called his people. What does Allah say? وَمَا آمَنَ مَعَهُ إِلَّا Only few people believed in him. After 950 years, That is not easy. His own wife did not believe, imagine. His son. Musa, alayhi salam, you know his story, how much he problems he faced with Fir'aun and the rest. Ibrahim, alayhi salam, his own father. Isa, alayhi salam, they wanted to kill him. Muhammad, alayhi salam, you know the problems he faced with his own people. Those are very simple examples. <coughs> Can women pray in congregation and get the same reward as men get? At home, inshallah. At home, yes, inshallah. When a person made a book of du'as, but... Sounds like me. But now, 
I know it is full of bid'ah. How can I approach her or correct her? You approach her like we said yesterday to the brother who's not here. With wisdom, soft speech, you pick the right time. And you have to have the proofs with you to show that this is wrong. This is how you do it. People don't like to be corrected. You have to know that that's the nature of human beings. Human beings, we don't like to be told that, you know what, you are wrong. Now you have to correct yourself. We don't like to be told, this is not how you do it. You do it this way. That's how we are. We all like to think that we know everything and we are already guided. Have we finished? <coughs> Any more questions? No questions today? The Quran you read when you get a new house, you call people and you read the Quran, then you have food. There has to be food. Otherwise, they won't come. <laughs> I'm serious. They won't come. If there's no food, they won't come. So they come for the Quran or the food? Huh? I go for both. <laughs> you go for both. <laughs> Mashallah, it's a good confession right there. There's nothing like that. You can do it yourself, you know, it's your new house, so you read the Quran, because the Quran chases away the, the devils or whatever. That is good. But calling people and making that a custom, everyone who gets a new house, we call people, we sit to read the Quran and have food. Now it becomes innovation. Yeah, an innovation. It becomes an innovation. He has the beard of the Prophet, sir. sir. One hair. Is it black or white? You didn't see it. For what? For the hair? And then? Eat and then? No, no, what's the connection with the hair? I want to know the connection. The house, you mean? Yeah, but okay, what's the connection between the hair and the Quran? Have you, you didn't see it though? Anyone saw it? Anyone saw it? How do you prove that though? That this is the hair of the Prophet Sassan? DNA? You're crazy. Many people claim that stuff, but I wouldn't trust it, to be honest. It's very hard to prove. No cloth can survive 1,400 years. At least from my simple knowledge of uh, science. Cloth can survive 1,400 years? Piece of cloth? I don't know. This is people, people who just fabricate things. I don't trust that. I don't trust that. Any more questions? <laughs> can you eat there? No, don't go. Don't eat. Because if you go and eat, you are actually encouraging them to do that. Yeah. Birthdays? We are Muslims. We don't have birthdays. We have death days. When people die, that's when you remember death. So you celebrate your birthday? You know, I like to put people on the spot. So you ask many questions, I ask you questions. You don't celebrate your birthday. Why not? Yeah. 
You get the cake, you put the candles, you blow the candles, yeah. you sing happy birthday. Yeah. You're not supposed to do that anyways. We don't celebrate birthdays. He said that's why he said he doesn't celebrate. I wouldn't eat from it. Okay. <laughs> Any more questions? No more birthdays, though. Without knowing what the others are doing, they say the same thing. That that is true, that is good, you know, all other things are like bida, this and that and that. So without knowing like everything, how can you just go for one like you know what I mean? You're asking basically how do you know the truth? That is your question. That's your question. How do you know the truth? We discussed that already. How do you know the truth? Who can answer him? Who can answer him? How do you know the truth? Yes. How do you know the truth? Tell him. Huh? Not yet. Yes, Muhammad. The first point he told you here. Uh -huh. You don't need, if your point is that you have to go with each, with each group and then finally you know the truth, who gives you the guarantee that you'll find the truth? You don't need that. You, need, you don't need to practically um, experiment with each group. You need to study the truth. What complies to the truth, he is correct. Whoever contradicts that, he's wrong. It's simple. It's simple. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Okay, we can start now. We are on page. We are on page. Guys, girls. Page three. We didn't finish page three. Yeah, we, sh we should start. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give me the signal. Or we can start. Is Starbucks halal? <laughs> hmm? Is Starbucks halal, guys? Huh? It's not Starbucks. It's not like I'm asking because I'm drinking, but I'm just asking. What do you guys think? Huh? Not everything. Not everything. Okay, let me rephrase my question. Can you go to get coffee from Starbucks? Yes, yes. Okay. Someone says no? <laughs> the symbol is a goddess. Mm. Okay. It's that bad. And they do what? Supporting Israel. You have proof for that. Do you have proof for that? Can you show me that? Okay, I'm waiting. No, not right now. It doesn't have to be right now. But I'm waiting for that. They say what? Uh huh. They don't support Israel. Show me the pamphlet. Okay, show it to me. You had an answer? No, show it to me first. No, question time is done. 
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده رسول بعد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد this is the fourth class of the عقيدة of the four imams أبو حنيفة مالك شافي عن أحمد we discussed last night in detail from the fundamental principles of the Sunnah is abandonment of bid'ah and every bid'ah is misguidance. And I think we didn't leave anything untouched for our level in expounding on that and everyone is comfortable. Number five then he said, وَتَرَكُ khusumat and abandonment of khusumat is controversies. And number six, وَالْجُلُوسُ مَعَ أَصْحَابِ الْأَهْوَى and the abandonment of sitting with the people of Al-Ahwa desires. And we said the people of desires, it means the people of innovation. Those, why are they called people of Ahwa? If you read all the books of, of Aqidah, all of them, they call these people, people of Ahwa, desires. Why do they call them that? It's because they left the texts, the Quran and the Sunnah on the way of the Sahaba. They left that and they followed what their own desires and their intellects told them this is right. That's why they're called people of Ahwa, people of desires. I have, we have a footnote there. Ibrahim bin Maisara, we quoted him. He's saying, he who, he who honors an innovator has assisted him in the demolition of Islam. You know this person is innovating in the religion, either in beliefs or in actions. You know he's bringing stuff which is not part of Islam. Yet you accommodate him and honor him and glorify him. It is just like you are actually helping him in doing what? Destroying Islam. Because Islam came from Allah. And he said it is complete, perfect. Anytime something which is complete from God, Allah, when you put human tampering into it, it does what? It's only going to spoil it. That's how bad innovations are. Innovations tamper with the complete religion which Allah sent. That's why Imam Malik, remember we quoted him, he said what? Whoever innovates something in Islam while deeming it to be a good innovation, saying that this is good, he has claimed that Muhammad sallam, has betrayed his trust in conveying the message. So, you don't just abandon the actual bid'ah, the innovation. You also abandon the people of innovation. The people of innovation. And I say it here again. You have to differentiate someone who fell into an innovation unknowingly. He thinks it's good because he has no other knowledge. Ordinary Muslim, you know, he just found someone who deceived him and told him, oh, this is good also. So he started practicing it. Are these the people we mean by abandoning them? No. This is a Muslim who was misguided by someone. So you just need to give him advice and bring him back to the, to the truth if you have that knowledge. The person who we're talking about abandoning them are those people who innovate and spread the innovations and call people to their innovations without hiding them. Those are the people we're talking about, abandoning them. Why do we abandon them? Because that is part of our religion. We read the ayah last night. Allah, he, he told us that. Number two, for the good of your own aqidah, for the good of your own belief, for the good of your own self. Because you never know, like the second, like the second quote we have there from Abu Qilaba. He says, do not sit with the people of innovation. Because I do not feel secure that they will not drown you in their misguidance. Or and make part of what you used to know unclear to you, give you doubts. So for your own sake, for your own good doing, you don't mingle, you don't sit with them. And we mentioned the proof for that was the hadith of the, of the Dajjal. The Prophet وسلم, said, when you hear that the Dajjal has come out, don't go looking for him, saying that I'm a true believer. Because you don't know. Maybe he'll give you doubts which will change you. A Muslim always 
is concerned about his belief. Your Islam is the most precious, most important thing you have. You have to protect it more than how you protect your body and your property. The more you are away from those people of innovation, the safer you are. It's just that simple. And don't say, no, I'll be with both groups. You know, they're Muslims also. They have some good in them. Yes, we're not saying because they're innovators, they became non-Muslims. They became disbelievers. We're not saying that. They're still Muslims. And every Muslim has good in him. It's simple. That is logical. Every Muslim has good in him. But the innovation he has is deadly. It's poisonous. It's toxic. So you abandon him for your own good and because it's a command from Allah and so that you don't go into the group of honoring him. Some people have this doubt. They say, oh, they have some good. They do this good and this good. Of course, nobody said they don't have any good. You won't find a Muslim who doesn't have any good. Zero percent. No, it doesn't exist. But that is not proof for you to mingle with him. Say, oh, I'm with this and I'm with that. He says from Imam al-Awza'i, a person says, he was asked, I sit with Ahlul Sunnah and I sit with the innovators. So al-Awza'i said, this person desires to fluctuate between the truth and falsehood. Commenting about the statement, Ibn Batta, he said, and the brother yesterday came and said, oh, you mentioned Ibn Batta, and I laughed. What does Batta mean? A Batta is a duck. Duck. So his, his name is Ibn Batta, the son of a duck. He is one of the greatest imams, in fact. One of the greatest imams of Islam. And he has a very good book on Aqeedah. It is called Al-Ibana. Al-Ibana. Very good book on Aqeedah. But it is his name. Some of them had funny names. Some of them had funny names. Ibn Bata, he says, commenting upon this statement, indeed, Al-Za'i has spoken the truth. And I say, indeed, this person does not know the truth from nor faith from disbelief. And this is something, to be honest, today many people, they try to turn a blind eye to, abandoning those people who you know they call to innovations, using proofs like those, which are not really proofs, doubts they have, or they do this good. They call people to pray. Oh, mashallah, do you hear his lectures? He's very good in his lectures. Oh, he has this charity. You know, he wrote this book. That is not proof for you to make him good. In Islam, how do you evaluate people? Their aqidah. And their actions. Do they conform to the way of the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba? Alhamdulillah, that's good. They do not conform. Then he has problems. It's that simple. Is that clear? Okay, point number two. Point number two. Even the people of innovations now, those who to abandon, they are in different levels. They are of different levels and in different levels. A person calls to celebrate Mawlid, the birthday of the Prophet But the rest of his Aqidah is can he or should you deal with him in the same way you deal with a Shia? Someone who curses the Sahaba and says the Quran is distorted and he said Ali was another prophet. And Can they be same? They are not same. They are not same. Even though all of them are in the group of people of innovation, at the same time, you have to be just. Do you understand? This one, you, des you are supposed to be very, very far from him. This one, you can bring him closer because his innovation is small. And you can, inshallah, if you have the knowledge, convey to him the right message and he'll turn back. Number three, when they talk, you'll find this in every book of Aqidah, like I said. Abandonment of sitting with the people of Ahwa or sitting with people of innovation. Every book of Aqidah, you'll find that. All of the Imams of Sunnah, they said that. What do they mean by people of innovation? Like we said before, people of innovation are those people who innovated in the Aqidah, mostly. Those are the main people of innovation 
the scholars they used to talk about, the people who deviated in the Aqidah, those 73 groups, those are more lethal and dangerous than the people who innovated in their actions. Those who innovated in their actions. Because corruption of the Aqidah is far worse than corruption of the actions. Is it clear? Is it clear? Okay. Next thing, number four. We have to know this very well. There is a big difference. And I mentioned this just previously. There is a big difference between someone who is good, his Aqidah is good, and he fell into a mistake. He fell into a mistake. There's a big difference between him and someone who's actually calling to innovations. Someone who's a real innovator, who does not hide his innovations. This one is good. He tries to follow the right Aqidah. He ascribes himself to the Salaf, the Sahaba. And he says, I follow that way. And he fell into one mistake or two, which are not major mistakes which takes him out of the group of Ahl Sunnah. He cannot be dealt with just like how you deal with someone who calls to the bid'ah, in fact. He not just fall into bid'ah, he is one of the leaders of the people of innovation. You don't deal with them equally. This one deserves more mercy. Do you understand? Why am I saying all this? Because there's people today, especially young fellows, who misuse these courts and take them absolutely in general, such that anyone who has a mistake, they abandon him. That is not what we call to. And that is not what, when they mention these terms or these principles, they never meant that. They used to talk about people who are the deep into innovations, people who innovated and are lost in their Aqidah. Someone who deviated in the Qadr, someone who is Murjia, someone who is Khawarij, someone who is Shia, someone who is Sufi. Those are the major groups of, the de of deviations in Islam. Not someone who is a good Muslim, he tries to have the correct Aqidah, he tries his best, but he fell into a mistake. We are not talking about that Muslim here. And that is a broad topic which you have to learn after also. That is why I said this is the beginning of our journey into studying Aqidah. You have to put that in the back of your head. That there is still much, much more of this. And this is something which is very intricate and delicate. How to deal with people's mistakes. How to weigh and value their mistakes. Is this the mistake which takes you out of the group of Ahl Sunnah? Or is it just a minor mistake? How do you know that? You have to study the Aqidah first. That is why I said to you, once you know the truth, the truth is the scale, then you know who's right, who's wrong. Next, inshallah, we take a small break and then come back. You have any questions now? Yes. There's a very well-renowned Qari, recite of the Quran. He is a Sufi. Listening to his Qiraat, does that fall into honoring him? I wouldn't say so. You can listen to his Quran. But I fear, I fear that we'll start liking him. Can't you find people who are good in the Aqid and listen to? No, 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 no. We don't have to mention the names. You don't, you don't have to mention names. Can't you find people who are better in recitation, listen to them, and better in the Aqid? Then why not? Yes.
informed about it by who? Who? Is it someone who's knowledgeable, qualified to do that? No, I didn't do. I didn't do that. I don't recall doing that. Don't speak. Oh, you're speaking hypothetically. Yeah. I thought you're speaking reality. No, no, don't ask hypothetical questions. <laughs> Is real now? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So next page. Now we move on. On the next page, he says, and these points are all on the same lines. All on the same lines. We're on page number four now, which is point number seven. Point number seven. He says, and وَتَرْكُ الْمِرَاءَ وَالْجِدَالُ وَالْخُصُمَاتِ فِي الدِّينِ and the abandonment of quarreling, argumentation, and controversy in the religion is one of the foundations of this religion. To abandon quarreling, argumentation, and controversy. It is not part of our beautiful religion just to argue for the sake of arguing and to have controversies and quarreling. It's not part of our religion. It's either you have a healthy dialogue which is going to lead somewhere, someone to the truth, someone really wants the truth, or you don't talk. It's just like that. As for quarreling, we don't have that in this religion. There's no point for that. You speak to those who want to know the truth, you bring them to the truth, you convey the message, you give them advice. Someone wants to quarrel for the sake of quarreling, no. It is found one of the found for one of the fundamental principles of the sunnah to abandon that. We don't go into that. And we have a footnote that it says, number five, Al-Khatib refers from Ishaq ibn Isa who said, I heard Malik ibn Anas censoring argumentation in the religion and saying, that is Imam Malik, that is Imam Malik, right? Remember we are studying the Aqidah of the four Imams. The actual text is from Imam Ahmad, the actual text we are reading. And the footnotes, we try as much as we can to quote from the other three Imams, Abu Hanifa, Malik, and, and Shafi. So Malik, he said, censoring argumentation in the religion, he was saying, is it to be the case that every time someone comes who can argue better than another one, that we are to abandon what Jibreel brought to Muhammad wasallam because of his argument? We argue with this person because he's very good in argumentation and debating. He's very good. So we leave what we know and follow him. Next time, another person comes who's very well trained in debating and proving his point. He comes and also argues with us. So we leave what we followed from him and then follow him. And then another one comes. He's very well, very nice debater also. He also debates with us. So we leave what we followed from him and follow him. Then we have no religion. We have no religion. He says, is it to be the case that every time someone comes who can argue better than another, that we are to abandon what Jibreel brought to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa We follow what Jibreel brought to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa The Quran and the Sunnah, the way the Sahaba performed it. Whatever conforms to that, it's good enough. Whatever does not conform to that, we don't need that argumentation. That is why sometimes when they used to come and they say to Malik, the people of Bid'ah, those who deviate, they'll say to him, I want to argue with you. I want to debate with you. I want to debate with you. You'd say, no. Go away. As for me, I know my religion. If you don't know your religion, go look for it. I don't need to debate with you. I don't need to argue with you. Someone who comes trying to convince you that what you are doing is wrong. The correct aqidah after you have learned it, someone comes and says, no, actually it's this way. He used to say, no, go find someone else. I know my religion. I don't need to argue with you. And that is the beauty of, of, of ilm, knowledge. Once you have knowledge, you know what you're following is truth. You don't need to be disturbed by people. But if you don't have the knowledge, anyone who comes, he's a good, sweet talker, very eloquent. You keep following. Tomorrow another one comes, you follow him. Learn the truth. Remember, the truth is the scale. You have the scale, you know what is right, what is wrong. Taib, he says, and Abu Nu'aym relates from a Shafi'i who said, 
We call him Malik, now it's Shafi'i. When some of the people of desires came to Malik bin Anas, he said, as for me, then I'm upon clear evidence from my Lord. Should be from, not froth. As for me, then I'm upon clear evidence from my Lord and my religion. And as for you, then you're in doubt, so go to a doubter and argue with him. Go and argue with him. Very clear and very sweet. Nice. From Imam Abu Hanifa. And that one you can read for yourself. You can read for yourself. Because we're not so um, wealthy in time today. We're quite poor in time today. It means we don't have so much time. So, number seven, the abandonment of quarreling, argumentation, and controversy in the religion. It's part of the fundamental principles of this religion. Number eight, was sunnah to indana athar rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi sallam was sunnah to fasir al Quran. And the sunnah with us are the athar. Athar means narrations, narrations of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi sallam. And the sunnah to fasir, it explains and clarifies the Quran. Number nine, wa hiya dala il Quran, and it is the guide to the Quran as to the meanings and, and correct interpretations. The sunnah with us. What is the sunnah? It is the athar, the narrations of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Whatever came from the Prophet sallallahu authentically, that is the sunnah. Whatever is not proven from him, we don't call that part of the sunnah. It's simple. That when you say anything, you say, okay, is there proof from the Prophet sallallahu wasallam? If it's there, then it's part of the sunnah, the part of Islam. If it's not there, you cannot ascribe that to Islam. It has to have the narration because all of this religion was transmitted to us. Everything, everything. That's the beauty of Islam. We are even taught the way of how to relieve yourself in the washroom. How to relieve yourself in the washroom, we are taught that. One of the Jews came to Ammar bin Yasser and said to him, Ya, ya Ammar, your prophet taught you everything. He said, yes, even the manners of the washroom. So he wasn't going to leave things which are more important like Aqidah. Everything you need has been transmitted. Whatever is there, that is part of the religion. Whatever is not there, it is not the religion. And like we said, we believe this religion is complete and Allah took it upon himself to preserve it. So he says, the sunnah with us are the narrations of the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the sunnah, it explains and clarifies the Qur'an. So this is a refutation and a reply to those people who say, no, you don't need to follow the sunnah, you only follow the Qur'an. Whom some people call them the Qur'aniyun. People who only want the Qur'an. But in fact, you cannot call them the people of the Qur'an. Because if they really read the Qur'an, the Qur'an will take them to the, to the sunnah automatically. So many proofs. And two weeks ago, three weeks ago, went the khutbah was about that. So I encourage everyone to go and listen to the khutbah, not last week, not the week before, week before that. Go and listen to that khutbah. That would, that's what it was about. Why you have to follow the sunnah. How the Quran points you to the obligation of this following the sunnah. There's no other way. There's no other way. One simple proof. Allah says, قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبِعُونِ Say to them, Muhammad, وسلم, if you really love Allah, then follow me. يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهَ Allah will love you, and Allah will forgive you your sins. If you really love Allah, all of us claim we love Allah. That's why we became Muslims, right or wrong? He says, if you really love Allah, then do what? Follow me. Now you tell me, how are you going to follow him? How? How are you going to follow him? Huh? Where is that? It's the sunnah. Simple. 
all their main proof, the main proof, those who reject the sunnah, they say, oh, this sunnah, this hadith were transmitted by men just like us, and people make mistakes. So-and-so, and a writer from so-and-so, from so-and-so, from Abdullah Mas'ud, or from Aisha, that the Prophet said this. They are human beings, they make mistakes. Maybe they forge some things. How do you respond to that? Huh? No, how do you respond to that? The Quran was written by humans too. And the Quran we have, it was transmitted the same way the hadith was transmitted. So and so taught so and so, he taught so and so, he taught so and so, he taught so and so. Then they came and taught us. Same thing. So if you are to have doubts in the Sunnah, you should have doubts in the Quran you claim you're following. And if you do that, then you have no religion. Very simple. Leave alone the tens of verses in the Quran and obey Allah and obey the Messenger. Obey Allah and obey the Messenger. How are you going to obey Him? When Allah said, Aqimu salata wa atu zakah, establish the prayer and give zakah. How do you establish the prayer? How do you give zakah? Because it doesn't say in the Quran how you give zakah. It doesn't say how much you give. Does it mean then we claim or we say to the Muslims you have to give 100% of your wealth? Or we say 2%? Or we say 10% like the Catholics? Who's going to say that? The Sunnah explained that. So to us, it is the guide to the Quran. The Sunnah is the guide to the Quran. And there's no other way. Again, you go back to that khutbah three weeks ago, you'll find enough proof there. Is it clear? That was something you have to take into consideration. He says, number 10, And number 11, Number 12, إِنَّمَا هُوَ الْإِتِّبَاعُ وَتَرْكُ الْهَوَى And there is no qiyas, reasoning by analogy in the sunnah. And examples are not to be made for it. Meaning you don't sit and think of something and say, you know what? Whatever I thought of, I think it just seems just like what the sunnah says. So this is part of the sunnah also. No. You don't sit and make up things from your own mind and say, this is like the sunnah, so let's make it sunnah. No. Not like that. Remember the first point, point number eight, the sunnah with us are the narrations of the Prophet That is the sunnah. Not analogical de deductions you do, and not examples. You don't do exam examples for it. Especially after we know that the sunnah is also, yeah, it's also revelation. Allah says about his prophet, Whatever he says is from the re revelation Allah gave him. Everything the Prophet Sam said about the matters of the religion, that is not his words. That is revelation. Anything he said about the worldly affairs, that is his words, his opinion. In the religion, it is only revelation. Do you understand? So you cannot give examples for it because revelation is from God. You cannot come up with something which is like revelation. He says, Number 11, Nor is it grasped and comprehended by the intellect. Ahwa. You just don't see, think, sorry, sit and think and say, this is how you do it. No. Innama huwa al-ittiba'u wa tarkul hawa rather it consists of al following. And depending upon it, and abandoning al-hawa desires. Like we mentioned so many times, Imam Ibn Shihabi said, Allah, he revealed the message. The Prophet Sallallahu his duty was to convey the message. Our duty is what? Follow the message. Simple. You don't leave the message, the Quran and the Sunnah, how the Sahaba practice it, and follow what your intellect says. Your desires want this. No. Innama hiya al-ittiba, wa al-ittiba, rather it consists of ittiba, following. This is how you see this point, and point number one, and two, and three go together. 
the fundamental principles of the sunnah with us are what? Number one. What does point number one say? Holding fast to what the companions of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu were upon. And number two, and taking them as a model to be followed. Following. Ittiba, following. Like that ayah, that verse I just read. Allah says in Surah Ali Imran, Qul, say to them, O Muhammad, in kuntum tuhibbun Allah, if you really love Allah, then do what? Fattabi'uni. Ittiba, follow me. Following. No one gave us the duty of sitting and thinking of things and making them into the religion. Simple, beautiful. We don't have to sit after every 20 years and come up with a new revised Quran. And then a new revised standard version. And then a new revised of the revised standard version. We don't have to do that in Islam. Everything is there. You just have to follow. Is it clear, guys? Okay, so we have to stop here today. Inshallah, we'll continue next time. You have any questions? Ask. Yes. No. Listen, what you, you have not understood the point before you go on. We say when he says there and there's no qiyas reasoning by analogy in the sunnah, meaning you don't sit and reason with something which is already there, and then you say, you know what? This is also part of the sunnah. Do you understand that? So that example you give, you cannot now say using your pickup truck, the example you give, is part of the sunnah. Can you say that? No, 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 no. Let him answer. Can you say that? You say the Prophet Sam rode a camel to go to this place. I'm going to ride my pickup truck. So because I'm going to the same place, I'm doing the same thing, this is also part of the sunnah. Can you say that? You cannot say that. That's the point. You cannot sit and think of things and then say, oh, these are part of the sunnah. Just because they resemble things which are done, no. We say these are tools we just use. They're just tools which we use. Analogy, qiyas, it's a broad topic which you don't have to learn now. And it's not here. We are studying Aqidah. Analogy which you're talking about, which you're allowed to use, is in Fiqh. Fiqh. It's a broad topic. One day you'll get there, inshallah. Yes. Yes, Akhi. We'll discuss them later on. But can you offer salah behind them? Yeah. Unless you have an option. If you have an option, no. Go to another masjid. They're still Muslims? Yes, they're still Muslims. All of it. Everything, it means everything. Everything which comes from the Prophet. When he says narrations of the Messiah of Allah Sallallahu means narrations from the Messiah of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We discussed that in the first class here. What is the Sunnah? His actions, his statements, and the things which he consented to, he approved. All of that is called Sunnah. Naam. Yes. I saw a hand. Sisters, questions? No one? Okay, yeah. Um, 
wearing a thobe like this? Is this part of the sunnah? This? I don't think this is part of the sunnah. I don't know. I don't know if any narration says the Prophet Sam wore a thobe like this. I don't know about that. The Kufi is covering the head. They used to cover the head everywhere they went. The Prophet Sam and his Sahaba would never rarely be seen without their heads being covered. Whether it is the turban, they used to wear the turban most. Okay, don't ask broad questions which don't have an answer. Ask specific questions. I don't get your question. Like what? Eating three deaths when breaking a fast. Is it sunnah? Yes, it is sunnah. Don't ask for example questions unless you have a question or ask that. Yeah. Don't ask the question of the, let's say, don't ask hypothetical questions. I always tell you that. We don't ask hypothetical questions. We ask reality questions. It's either there or it's not there. Yes, Nam. We mentioned about Ibrahim bin Maisara. We mentioned about Abu Qilaba yesterday. Abu Qilaba is one of the students of Ibn Abbas and Anas bin Malik. It's from the Tabi'in. He saw the Sahaba. And Ibrahim bin Maisara also same thing. And look at the date. See, okay. That's why we put the dates of their death right after their names. Ibrahim bin Maisara, he died in which year? 132. This is on page 3. The footnote of page 3, footnote number 4. If you look at the date, it tells you how valuable, if you can say valuable, or how great that person is. The more close he is to the Prophet Sallallahu then you need to respect him more. 132, it means he saw the Sahaba. Second generation of Muslims. 140, he saw the Sahaba. Definitely. 157, Allahu A'lam. Did you see the Sahaba or not? The more close they are, the more respectable they are. But we cannot go into biographies of each of them. Then we'll need six months for this class. Mm -hmm. Yes? You have no questions? I have questions for you, you know. It's not good, but it doesn't, it's not haram, yeah. but it's not good. Like I said, the Prophet Sallallahu and his Sahaba, that's what they say. They'll never be seen outside or in the masjid without covering their heads. The beard is a must. If you shave your beard, you're committing sins. You're committing sins. Specifications? As in? Yeah, if your beard is long enough after one qabd, if you can grasp your beard like him, his beard is big. Whatever goes past the fist, you can trim that. How big is the sin? It's a sin. It's a sin, it's a sin. And the Prophet emphasized it in so many hadith. And that's how the Muslim man stands out from the rest of the people. We keep our beards and we trim our mustache. That's how you stand out. When someone sees you, he knows, okay, this is a Muslim. Right away. And you look more of a man. Have you seen a lion with no beard? No. Have you seen a lion with no beard? They don't exist. The female, the lioness does not have a beard. I'm just saying. 
Muslim men have to keep the beard. It's a must. And it does not take away from anything. If you feel that if you keep your beard, you won't become rich or you lose your job, then I'm sorry. That is the thing which will make you lose your job. I'm telling you. Yes, you only have two minutes. Good. Anyone else has a question? Do you have your emails? Everyone, we have his or her email. All of you? You filled the form, didn't you? You didn't put your email there? Mm, you'll take the emails then. I'll send you the book there. Yes. You're not supposed to cut your hair on one side and leave one side. The kaza'a, that's called kaza'a in Arabic. The mohawk. You know the mohawk? You cut your hair this side and you leave this. It's haram Islamically. That's what the Jews used to do back then. You'll be amazed. The hadith is in Sahih Bukhari. That's how they used to cut the hair. Cut one side and leave another side. What about the Afro? Uh -huh. No, no. The Prophet said, the one whom Allah blessed him with hair, let him take good care of it. If your hair is long and you take good care of it, it doesn't stink, it doesn't smell, that's good. You put oil on it, conditioner, perfume, shampoo, good. Nothing wrong with keeping long hair like that. Just don't tie it like a woman. So we don't know. When you see from the back, we don't know. Is a sister, is a brother. Don't do that. Okay, we'll continue next week, inshallah. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Shalala al